Now we're going to look at Elijah the prophet. And Elijah the prophet, I know he's not a king, but he is one of the most noteworthy characters in the Bible. Probably out of all the kings in First and Second Samuel, First Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, he's probably a more noteworthy character than all of them outside of David and Solomon. I mean, I would place him above Saul, myself personally. But I also want to talk about the topic of Elijah and Bible believers. What do we Bible believers have in common with Elijah the prophet? The first thing is prophecy. In 1 Kings 17.1, it says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. You see, Elijah received direct prophecy from the Lord. He said to Ahab that there wouldn't be any rain until he said so. The mark of a true prophet is that what he says comes to pass. Now, me and you do not get new prophecies from the Lord like Elijah did. The Lord wrote to us all the prophecies that we need to know in his Bible. And when I quote his prophecies as a sure thing, I'm no different than Elijah. The only thing is... I get my prophecies from the Word of God, and Elijah was getting them directly from God without the Bible. But God told Elijah the future, and he believed it. God tells me the future in his Word, and I believe it. So in that sense, as a Bible believer, I'm no different than Elijah, and Elijah's no different than me. We're both just believing what God said. But... Elijah is saying here that there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And this is talked about in the New Testament as well. In James five seventeen and 18, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and, he, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Then in Luke 4.25, But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. The fact that Elijah prayed away the rain, and they were without rain for three and a half years, pictures something in the tribulation. Because you, that three and a half years is significant. Look at Revelation 12.14. It says, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness and to her place where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time from the face of a serpent. From the face of the serpent. That time, times, and half a time. A time is a year. Times is two years. And half a time is six months. So three and a half years. In the future time period, Daniel's 70th week, what we've referred to as the tribulation, the Jews will be nourished from the, by the Lord for three and a half years. And that is what this story with Elijah here is going to be a picture of. God will provide for them during that time, just like he's providing for Elijah during this time. Notice I just prophesied, though. What I said will come to pass because I got it directly from the scriptures. What Elijah says is going to come to pass because he got it directly from the Lord himself. Something you also need to realize is that Elijah is going to be one of the two witnesses that pops up during that future time period. Look at 1 Kings 17, 1 again. It says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand. Notice he says, before whom I stand. Now, go to Revelation 11 and look at this story about the two witnesses. He says in Revelation eleven three. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Notice it says, standing before the God of the earth. And Elijah, it says, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, back in 1 Kings 17.1. So you see they're both standing before the God of the earth. And then in Zechariah 4.14, 4, another uh, a prophecy about the two witnesses, it says, Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. 
So there's a similarity there. Also remember that Elijah is said to be the one who comes before the day of the Lord. In Malachi 4, 4 through 5, it says, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So right there, it shows you that Elijah does come back. Also, notice who is mentioned there in Malachi 4.4. 4. It's Moses. So you have the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, the last two men that are mentioned in the Old Testament. And if you think that's far-fetched, that they come back again in the tribulation, consider the fact that they have already showed up once together again already. In Matthew 17.1-3, through 3, it says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, which is Elijah, talking with them. So they both showed up then. Why couldn't they show up again later? Also remember the fact that Elijah is never said to have died, and he was taken up by a whirlwind into heaven. And the devil and Michael the archangel are disputing about the body of Moses in the book of Jude. So Elijah says to Ahab, There shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Elijah had the power to pray, and the Lord would shut heaven so that it would, so that it would not rain. This matches what the two witnesses are going to do. In Revelation 11, back in that two witnesses chapter, these it says, These have power to shut heaven, in verse 6 that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. So Elijah the prophet is a rough character, as you're going to see, and he goes straight up to King Ahab here, the most wicked king up to that date, and just prophesies doom and gloom. Ahab was a wicked king with an even wickeder wife. I mean, he's like that country singer. He likes his women a little on the trashy side, I guess. When he picked her out of the bunch, he said, Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a bad chick by her toe, like that stupid rap song says. I mean, they just, they're going out and choosing the, the sluttiest, sleaziest woman at the club they can find and choosing her to to be their their wife. And he, he just really knows how to pick them, so he picks Jezebel to be his wife. And she makes a wicked king even more wicked. But Elijah goes up to Ahab and just says, tells him what the Lord has him to say. But we are like Elijah because we have prophecies. The only difference is that mine is already wrote down and ready for me in 66 books of the King James Bible, and Elijah was didn't have a Bible. So that's the only difference. All he, he would have had was was just was just some of the Old Testament. He didn't even have all the Old Testament. Me and you have all the Old Testament and the New Testament. But next... We both have precious words. Not only do we have prophecy, but we got these precious words. First Kings seventeen two, and the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, "So, the word of the Lord will come unto you, saying some things." In John fourteen twenty six, it says, "But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you." If you stay in the Bible and memorize, and study, and read, and meditate, and pour over the scriptures, then you'll find that the word will just come to you. You have precious words. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, The word of the Lord will come unto you, saying, Because the Holy Spirit's going to bring all things to your remembrance. In Psalm 12, 6 through 8, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side, when the vilest men are exalted. And Ahab was exalted during the days of Elijah. It was, so it was a time of the wicked walking on every side. It was a time of darkness for a Bible believer. Sometimes all you have are those precious words. But next, we both have protection. In 1 Kings 17.3, it, uh, it says, Get thee hence, God tells Elijah, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith. That is before Jordan. So God told Elijah what to say, and also tells him where to go. He told him to hide thyself. 
And in Psalm 32, 7, it says, Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. Every Bible believer loves to stick his face in the word and hide a little bit. Notice that Elijah didn't stay hid. He would always come back out and tell someone the thing that God told him. We need to do that as well. We have so many treasures in the scriptures. And we just shouldn't keep it all to ourselves. We need to get out and show the world what God has shown us when we're in our hiding place. But God gave Elijah protection. He gave him a hiding place. Remember how I said Elijah pictures the Jews in the tribulation and Ahab would picture the Antichrist? Well, in Mark thirteen fourteen, it says, But when you shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that's when the Antichrist is going to sit in the temple claiming to be God, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand, then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. So the Jews in the tribulation are going to be in hiding. And the Lord's going to be their hiding place. Today, the Lord is our hiding place. He's where we go when we need to get away for a while. When the Jews see the Antichrist sit in the temple claiming to be God, they will then understand that he's a phony and that they need to get out. But he's going to be their hiding place. So we have protection like Elijah. We have precious words like Elijah. We have prophecy and we also have provision. In 1 Kings 17, 4 it says, And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So God gave him a place to drink. He even commands the ravens to feed Elijah. Notice that the animals always do what the Lord commands them to do. 1 Kings 17, 5 So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord for he went and dwelt by the book brook Cherith that is before Jordan so Elijah is all by himself by the brook he seems to be a bit of a loner and many Bible believers are loners the temptation of isolation might be their biggest temptation many times first Kings seventeen six, and the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening and he drank of the brook so he had two meals a day maybe that's the best plan people always tell me to eat six small meals a day that seems a bit much to me Elijah had two meals a day. This bread and flesh was right out of the mouth of an unclean bird. So Elijah was obviously not a germaphobe. He was obviously not a vegetarian because he was eating bread and flesh. And obviously God didn't want him to be a vegetarian because he was the one telling the ravens to bring in the bread and the flesh. But Elijah was a rough character like John the Baptist. And he didn't care to eat the, the flesh out of these unclean birds as they're called in Le uh, Leviticus eleven thirteen through 15 it lets you know that the raven is an unclean bird and ravens also picture unclean spirits Revelation eighteen two will show you that so the, the raven carrying Elijah the food they say this pictures God using uh, the devil's crowd to take care of his children and that happens with you every day. Most likely the company you're working for is not a Christian company. And that's who's paying you. I mean, that's where you're making your living. But the raven is the bird Noah sent out and never returned back there in Genesis 9, probably because it was feeding on the floating carcasses or something. But ravens are not clean animals. They're unclean birds, and God used ravens to feed Elijah. And it says in 1 Kings 17, 7, And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Don't ever take the brook for granted. Uh, you may have the word of God to cleanse you right now, but someone might come in to try and take it away. Maybe Elijah could have stored some of the water in bottles and buried it so that it wouldn't have dried up or something. Right now I'm trying to build a massive library and collection of Bibles and Bible-believing material. I have it on flash drives, I have it on my bookshelf, I have it stored on my phone and my laptop. You never know when the brook is going to dry up. I mean, all the good preachers are getting older, they're going to die off, they're, they're getting old. Uh, the liberals may pull the plug on freedom of speech on the internet. Collect what you can, and then you'll have it later when the brook dries up. When Israel picked up the manna, they gathered twice as much on the sixth day. God provided, and they had to consider that seventh day 
because they wouldn't be able to go out and gather on that day. So consider your future. You know, you need to be storing some things away for to use if if you can't use it anymore. If some if they pull the plug on it. You may, you may be used to listening to preaching on the internet now, but one day somebody's going to pull the plug on it. Maybe you should store some up for the future. You got the Word of God now. Maybe you should store a Bible or two away in case they try to take it away one day. Exodus sixteen twenty two, And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. So on the sixth, ga sixth day they gathered twice as much. They were thinking about the future there. Gather up twice as much stuff today, and you'll be able to use it when the plug is pulled. And I don't know if you noticed, but your average store doesn't sell Bible-believing material or King James Bibles anymore. So probably in the next 20 years, there's not going to be a Bible-believing store anymore. But next, me and Elijah were both supposed to do personal work. You're going to see that even though Elijah is a loner, that he still does some personal work. In 1 Kings 17, 8 through 9, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get, de get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Psalm 55, 22 says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. So God is still providing. He's already got, a, got someone in mind to help Elijah. A widow woman would be more likely to help than a rich woman. The more you have, the harder it is to let go of. 1 Kings 17.10 So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Well, what does that remind you of? This woman, she's going to go get Elijah some water. And Mark 9, 41 says, For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. So, this, I believe this woman's reward is going to be great. And while she's going to get water, Elijah says, And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thy hand. So this is how my sister used to do me when we were kids. She'd say, go get me a drink. And while I was going to get her a drink, she said, get me the remote. While I was getting the remote, she'd say, go get me some Fritos. And before you accomplish anything she asked, she asked for something else. I mean, she was just being rude. Now, Elijah isn't trying to be rude. This is all a test. He's testing the faith and service of this widow. So this is a Gentile woman. And if you have read Matthew 25, then you know that Gentile nations... Uh, or God's going to have them nations gathered at the judgment of the nations. And the ones that were good to his people, uh, they're going to get to enter the land based on the fact that they took care of the Jews. Now, this widow helping Elijah pictures that. And you can read about this in Matthew 25, 34 through 40. It says in verse 37 in Matthew 25, Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw, the, saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So God considers you helping one of his people, uh, a born-again believer, and today, in our case, if you help another born-again believer, then God considers you helping him. In 1 Kings seventeen twelve, And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruse. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. So she only had a handful of of meal in a barrel. This is where you get the saying, scraping the bottom of the barrel. She had a little oil in a cruise, like a canteen thing. The good thing is that the Lord can do a lot with a little. And you saw what he did with a little fish, two small fishes and some bread. He fed thousands of people. So Elijah says in verse 13, Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but, bring, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after, make for thee and for thy son. Elijah isn't being selfish 
This is obviously a test of the woman's faith. He knows that the it's not going to run out. 1 Kings 17, 14, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. So Elijah knew that there would be pl plenty for all of them. In 1 Kings seventeen fifteen, And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. So a handful turned into many days worth of food. Verse 16, And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruse of oil fail according to the words, uh, word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. He keeps proving that he's a real prophet. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. So you're going to see how the son is actually a picture of Jesus Christ. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? Notice that she is humble. She knows she is a sinner and deserves any bad thing that comes her way. And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon this woman with whom I so sojourn by slaying her son? Notice that although Elijah is a loner, he takes care for others and comes out of his shell. He prays for others and bears their burden. You don't have to be outgoing and an enthusiastic person to help somebody out. In 1 Kings 17, 21, he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come unto him again. So he is giving him artificial respiration. The child's soul had left his body. And that is what happens at death. Your soul leaves your body. It said, Let this child's soul come unto him again. And in Genesis thirty five eighteen it says, And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died. So at death your soul leaves your body. That is the true thing. At death your soul leaves your body, and Elijah is praying that his soul will come into him again. In first Kings seventeen twenty two, and the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again and revived. So Elijah uh, started a revival here. And the widow's one and only son resurrects, just like the father's one and only son resurrects. First Kings seventeen twenty three, And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. So the son is brought down out of the chamber and is shown that he is alive. And this could picture Jesus Christ coming back at the second coming and the Jews and the people of the world realizing he's alive. 1 Kings seventeen twenty four. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. So by this she knew it was true. And when Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming, every eye shall see him and that it was true. They're going to see that it was true all along.